call the meeting to order on Tuesday, August 19th, 2016. It's a special meeting. Mr. Wilson, will you please call the roll? Mrs. Briner? Here. Ms. Gisling? Present. Mr. Shaw? Here. Mr. Tuttle? Here. Ms. Miller? Here. We have a flag please up there. stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Wilson, is it your yes, turn? Yes, uh, we distributed a folder with materials. Uh, I'd like to go through them very quickly. Uh, our goal tonight is reach a decision point on a target year for uh, the new levy proceeds as far as how many budget years they'll fund. Uh, we began with notes we distributed after our last work session on May 31st where the consensus was that we didn't want to uh, fall back to the normal three to four year cycle that's uh, inherent in the way schools are funded in the state of Ohio. Uh, so we determined we do want to extend the levy cycle beyond the 18-19 year as uh, predicted in the five year forecast. Um, we wanted to guide our uh, setting of a target year on through the five fiscal beliefs that we embraced a number of years ago. And then we, under those uh, major expense categories that we manage, salaries, benefits, special ed and facilities, we indicated some possible tactics to execute based on the decision. So that kind of set the framework for tonight that the consensus was, let's pick some date other than 2019, let's drive it through the five fiscal beliefs then the next couple charts are based on actual performance uh, for the 2015-2016 year. We provided a brief summary uh, at the July board meeting and um, I've updated the charts for our purposes tonight and I'll just walk through them very quickly. Uh, they're the ones with the shaded areas. The first one says general fund income showing that Actual incomes last year were 5520000 above the um, budget, uh, about $4,200,000 uh, of that was primarily the result of the sale of delinquent tax liens by the county treasurer that not only produced uh, a significant amount of money over a million dollars in past due delinquencies, but also accelerated the voluntary payment of past due delinquencies and a higher current collection rate. So we believe that was um, impacted by that sale and as the number of delinquent taxes diminishes, the opportunity for another bump also diminishes. The rest of it you'll see Medicaid reimbursement was about 600,000 more. That was a true up of the two. Uh, 2011-2012 school year, 2012-2013, there's about a four-year delay by the federal government in final reimbursements. So on the, the, just yes. a quick question on the um, delinquent taxes. We shouldn't expect that opportunity to come along again unless possibly the economy goes into a downturn where people Correct. go delinquent and then it increases and they can go ahead and pay those taxes in arrears. Do you think that's what happened? Yes, Somewhat I think it was the, uh, the Great Recession, I think, um, created more than the normal amount of delinquent taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the regular uh, collection methods, um, short of a uh, tax lien sale, is there's a one-time 10% penalty as soon as you're late, and then there's an annual interest uh, added on based on the federal uh, treasury note rate which has been less than one percent uh, and sadly some people realized that if they didn't pay their taxes other than getting a letter in the mail nothing bad happened and were challenged to otherwise do what they needed to do for their family and just let these slide the introduction of the delinquent tax lien sale uh, created a negative consequence that many people wanted to avoid so yes I do agree 
I, short of an, another significant downturn in the, the economy that um, uh, creates more uh, delinquent taxes, I think this was a catch-up, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and going forward, we won't see that again. So is there a norm when, when yours are, when the economy is good, I, I guess, uh, of, yes. of what we normally can anticipate for uh, delinquent yeah. taxes? And, and our com community within the school district, the two municipalities and a little bit of the other areas, um, the county certifies 96% current collections and our average has been just over 98% and we believe that's going to be more uh, in the round of 98.5% or 98.75% uh, going okay. forward. Good, thank you. Sure. On the expense side, uh, we had a successful fiscal year. Uh, we underspent the budget. We had more than expected uh, turnover in our faculty, which meant uh, incoming people generally being placed on the salary schedule at a significantly lower amount. Uh, we had uh, most of the people that departed uh, had family insurances, uh, more than the normal amount of those hired, uh, only selected single insurance. So there was a significant reduction there also. So that was the primary driver of uh, the underspending in the budget. And then if you go to the page with the yellow stripe across it, uh, we presented this at the first work session, but now it's updated. The shaded area in blue shows the actual performance in 15-16. Even with now uh, the success of the March 15th levy, we're predicting a deficit of 19,617,142 for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. As, as we've said in the past, and as you know, the Ohio Constitution prohibits deficit spending, so we're prohibited from adopting a budget in 1920 with a deficit, uh, so we'll have to resolve that before July 1st of 2019, uh, either with reductions in spending or an increase in revenues um, through a future tax. The uh, next page behind that shows uh, uh, something that's a little bit new for us, I've, I've shown it to you a couple times before, but I'm going to begin to include it in my key financial indicators, and that's deficit spending defined as current year income compared to current year expenses. As you know, we have accumulated cash reserves for uh, the possibility of another downturn in the economy or other unexpected occurrences. And you'll see for the preceding three years, we spent more than we took in, and that's where those lines cross on the one line chart that we use as one of our significant key financial indicators. Last year, for the first time in three, uh, four years, we uh, spent less than we took in, again, primarily because of that one-time occurrence with the sale of delinquent tax lien. But then with continued decreases in state funding, we're predicting deficit spending each year going forward. That is, that we spend more in a year than we take in. Recognizing my conservatism, uh, both the Finance Committee and the Board have said, um, continue to refine your formulas and methodologies, but also give us something that reflects your consistent conservative nature. And this is updated also from our last work session that says, what if we received 1% more in tax collections than, the, than is certified by the auditor's office? What if we spend 2% less in expenses than your formulas um, uh, predict in the fiscal projections? So we layered that in uh, on top of the new levy, and you'll see that deficit in 1920 was reduced from 19 million to 8 million So we still have a deficit, but perhaps a more manageable deficit. And in the last page, we're showing current year deficit similar to what you saw. So that leads us then to, um, in the context of our fiscal beliefs, and we gave you another copy of those, the first and foremost uh, is all decisions are made in the context of the five-year fiscal projections. And that's what we presented to you um, in this, uh, previous exhibit saying if we look out five years in the future, in this case four years, we see a deficit even though um, 
we're, we can spend down our cash reserves this year. So we are taking that five-year look. We're saying we want to uh, know where we're going to be five years from today and, and do what we can to manage that. And then the other fiscal beliefs, um, uh, there's management options every dollar we spend. Uh, we have a strong bias. Every dollar must add value to teaching and learning and then aggressively manage our largest expense areas that you saw in the meeting summary from <coughs> And finally, quality is always cheaper in the long run, suggesting we just don't buy the cheapest because we can't afford the other. We need to discuss the options we have and, and how we could uh, make prudent decisions, not just the cheapest decision. And then finally, the history of school levies, and you've seen this many times yes. before leading up to our um, decision. The uh, stretch of time between new levies from August of 2004 until March of 2016 was 12 years, not a span that we've seen going back to 1980, and I would suggest probably if we went back uh, through the entire century of, of the 1900s, I doubt if we're going to find a 12-year find a uh, levy span. Um, and you'll see if you just scan through, as we've talked before, the normal frequency has been uh, right around four years. So uh, that's what leads us to our decision point of um, if we want to do something other than the, our standard of aggressive fiscal management, uh, we want to base it on what's that target within the context of the five years. Um, and that's, again, leading us to um, right now we predict we would need a levy of some amount in 2019. Uh, do we want to extend that to 2020, 2021, 2022 was one suggestion in our last meeting, recognizing that if we go four, five, or six years, then some of these tactics listed under the big spend areas are things that we, uh, Matt and I, will begin to immediately include in our fiscal management and the finalizing of the uh, budget for this year so that we have, the, the more years we have to manage to that future date, the more we can spread um, the uh, benefit of, of aggressive management. So we want to not lose the entire 16, 17 year and have deliberately slowed uh, the normal budget development process and uh, with the expectation that you would be able to give us guidance tonight. So with that, I think I've reviewed the materials and happy to provide more data or more explanation, but the, the core issue before us is can you give us guidance on a target year uh, that Matt and I can work towards as we're developing this budget and budgets going forward? I thought that our last meeting we had talked about, I think Mary said something about making cuts across the board and reducing the spending. And I was hoping to maybe come here to see where we could reduce some of the spending to give us a better idea of how it would affect the teaching and learning. I mean, are there discretionary spending? And I realize we don't have a lot of that. And, and where we could reduce the spending to give us a better idea how far out in the future we could put the levy. Because didn't you say something like that, Mary? Yep. Yes. So for us, I don't know, it would be really hard for me to just say, sure, let's pick 2020. You know what I mean? If well, we don't know the true effects of what, it, what it's going to do to our students. And, and as a follow-up to that meeting, and you're absolutely right, and the takeaway from that, the meeting summary attempted, it didn't put dollar signs with everything, but said, again, driving the discussion through our five fiscal beliefs and realizing that we could say everybody make uh, half as many photocopies next year. We're not talking about the type of dollars that are going to extend how long between levies. So when we did salaries, we tried to identify some uh, a current aggressive management strategy or tactics we're using, but also uh, some additional things that we can do to realize it is going to take significant actions. And again, with the bias towards going to the operational side first, um, 
to um, protect teaching and learning. So we talked about uh, adjusting for declining enrollment. The first thing that we did after that meeting, Matt commissioned an update to the 10-year enrollment study uh, to help us better refine what's our opportunities to adjust staffing going forward. The next was uh, how aggressively, and you'll recall when we came out of fiscal emergency, uh, we were very aggressive in matching uh, staffing to programming, uh, such things as all the various individual offerings uh, at the middle schools and the high schools, what type of participation we had. And if we had a uh, career technical program that had three students enrolled, while that was very important to three students, we said we're probably not going to offer that course internally, we'll try to help find other options for them. So that was the type of analysis that we went through in 2004-2005 year, but we really haven't done real aggressively since then. We, we, at that time we, we did that thorough analysis and we tried to maintain that, uh, but that's another option. Go deeper, do we set minimum class size for optional uh, courses that would dictate how much staffing we have, knowing that does get into the teaching and learning area. The administrative staffing, as you know, Matt's doing a compensation study to determine are we uh, paying market rates for the people. We've also had two administrative reductions coming into this school year, so we've uh, done more than, than was required in the five-year forecast staffing program for this year. Now, on the benefit side, as you know, we are been very engaged with the Lake Health um, Center that's going to be constructed on our campus with an ultimate long-term goal of reducing our health care costs by incorporating wellness, access to non-urgent care uh, health needs, uh, whether or not the industry right now is evolving to what's called a narrow network. It's almost the old Kaiser Permanente model of uh, you know, you have, uh, you go to this doctor, you go to this hospital, unless it's something that requires a specialist, then you still have pretty open range to do that. And I think that's something that we're looking at in there. That does require collective bargaining, uh, but that's part of how aggressive we are in uh, narrowing uh, uh, Provider options based on some quality filter is another possibility with dollar savings. Back in 04, 05, we were very aggressive in trying to determine uh, how best to serve the needs of students with special needs in district at a lower cost and placing them out of district. Uh, we've maintained that when we reset the level, but our tuition costs grew by a million dollars last year. So is there an opportunity for us to, to circle back to that and say, how can we provide the services that our students need but do it in a more cost-effective way and, increase, and include the cost dynamic and that whole process of an IEP, a 504 plan um, to not sacrifice quality, as our fiscal belief says, but, but say cost is something we want to talk to in that process. So uh, that's another tactic available to us. As you know, even with the new enrollment study, we've not bottomed out yet. We graduated 660 plus students. Uh, our incoming kindergarten class is right around 550, maybe a few more. So we're still not uh, bottomed out yet. And there, the reality is when we look at facilities and the number of classrooms we operate, uh, there's probably uh, the opportunity to reduce the number of classrooms, which means closing a building, mm -hmm. and most likely a middle school. I was uh, going to ask, Dan, is a building closure in uh, any of your projections? No. Okay. And no. do we know uh, what our history has been in savings, having done it a few yes. times on average? Yes, we have closed four elementaries and the average savings has been about 750000 a year. So again, over a five-year uh, time period, um, you know, a very significant amount, about uh, 
three point five. Yeah, million. So that's one way. And if we want to maximize the use of the classrooms we operate, revisiting once again grade configuration. When we went from a 10-12 high school to a 9-12, when we had a desire to add all day, every day kindergarten, part of that uh, tactic was let's uh, move the ninth graders in, move sixth graders there, free up the space in the elementary so we can have all day, every day kindergarten. So this is an educational decision that has teaching and learning impact, but for great configuration uh, greatly influences how many classrooms we need. And the same with attendance areas. And historically, we've not annually or biannually adjusted attendance areas, but it's another technique to try to balance out and maximize uh, the use of classrooms with the goal of using less, less classrooms. So while we don't have dollar amounts there, we tried to identify the possible tactics. Don't you think doing a all-encompassing analysis after 11 years is kind of just good business practice? Uh, yeah, I don't know what the right number of years is, but yes, it's certainly... I mean, it hasn't been two or three. Yeah, it's been a while. I, yeah, I think it's, it's well overdue. And again, other than from the, my lens of a dollar sign, I'd say, yeah, it's overdue from the impact on the uh, uh, evolution of teaching and learning in our district, the impact on, on where we're headed. You know, that's more Matt's world. But yes, I would say prudent oversight by the board would say on a periodic basis um, we're, we're due for a pretty comprehensive look at that. So in that vein, Matt, I know a couple of years ago at least, um, I think you and Dan both had thought that in the future um, kids won't be coming to school you know, five days a week. Are, are we obviously we're closer are we almost there do you see that in the next uh, three or four years I would say um, best guess would probably be closer to five to five be honest with you mm -hmm. as an option and but I don't think it'll be everybody and I, I would imagine that would start with a population. small group yes probably at the high school right. level and what we more we've distance learned, learning what we've learned is through what we've done just in a short amount of time is kids still need that contact with the teacher. It can't be all or nothing yeah. to be successful. That's what we're learning. And that's what we're getting the feedback from the kids too and from the parents. That they want the teacher. They, they still they need that, that contact. They they still, right. Yeah. Not all the time and not right. for every kid. But right, that's right. like a lesson learned, I would say. Would, could we, is there any way to start that with maybe kids that are identified as gifted? And, and maybe you know, they, they still need the they still, they still need the interaction. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, think I just they, don't think it has to be five days a week, but yeah. it, it can be something different. The the other thing too to to sort of back up a little bit on on uh, on some of what we're looking at is that what I think we've been pretty um, I don't say tightening the belt for a while now, so I don't know why we would shift away from that. I mean, we've been looking. I mean, when we talk, you know before about, I'll just use the example of rice, that wasn't because so much we wanted to save money, it was a natural evolution of declining enrollment and right. it made good financial sense. So I think Dan and I, and I don't want to speak for Dan, but Dan and I will still make decisions or still move the, uh, the football down the field, so to speak, in terms of um, making the best investment where it doesn't hurt kids, but it's still financially responsible. If you're looking at closing, let's say, a middle school at some point, I would suspect that perhaps that $750,000 might even be a higher amount because you have Absolutely. more square footage. Right. And we're moving kids to the cusp of the district in some cases in terms of transportation. Yeah. And so consolidating things in some fashion and the fact that you've got teachers having to travel, mm -hmm. you can also consolidate their schedules so that their world is more efficient, so that they're available for duty or, or whatever um, in addition to the classes that they teach, so that there may be economies that go with looking at that. So to, to go back to Sally's thought, I think we can certainly 
come up with a common sense recommendation based on what our takeaway from our community is. That was a very close levy. Mm -hmm. That's the community's way of saying we're, that right. they're supportive and want quality schools and are willing to pay for them. However, their expectation is that we continue to be as thrifty, mm -hmm. sensible, forward-looking as possible, to make sure that we make good on that so that if we make a decision that we would like to reach toward a certain <coughs> cycle, time-wise, before our next levy, then you could advise us as to these are components that could make that happen. And then we can look at how those individual components have a direct or indirect impact on students and the teaching and learning that we're here to do. I, I don't see where one method is going to work. We're, we're not going to cut enough expenses without really cutting back on, on programs. I mean, $8 million, that, that's a or 19 million uh, either way. I agree with you but I don't I don't think and I don't know I don't want to give the impression that we're being um, I can think of frugal that's the opposite of frugal the word I'm trying to think of you know kind of like spend thrifty and everything you know everything is still good I want I want well, everything I, isn't good I, I know it's <laughs> not good but I agree with what you're saying we're never going to be able to cut back to yeah. catch up so it, it yeah. seems to me that we're, we're kind of headed down the road of a looking at reducing expenses, mm -hmm. certainly, mm -hmm. but maybe a, I don't know, a smaller millage, you know, one or two or something. I mean, mm -hmm. We're, we're going to have to raise some mm -hmm. revenue as well. Sure. Right. We yeah. just don't know how much. Right. And if you remember, we did have a study done of optimum millage amounts. Mm -hmm. and, right. And that right. study said under three mills has the highest percentage right. passage rate. Three to five mills you're, is still above 50 percent. Yeah. like, yeah. Above five mills. And that's kind that's of validated quick. when you look at our own data. Sure. And, and to follow up on what Matt said in this conversation, uh, two things. One is if we say we want to go further in 2019, that means we have to do more than our current aggressive budget management. It's, it's just not going to, you can't just declare it and, it and it happens. And the second is that in all these tactics, using our fiscal beliefs, it would suggest that we need to insert budgetary tension in all of those decisions, more so than we did already. Matt has reduced staffing more than required in our five-year forecast every year he's been here. The two administrative reductions were not included in the forecast, but to introduce uh, in facilities that as we're planning for the 17-18 year, uh, you've got to cost justify how many buildings you have is a whole different discussion right. than how do we maximize the use of the building absent that budget tension. So, Part of what will be different is that if you say, do your darndest to wait until 2022 with the understanding the absolute ceiling is five mils based on that study, and we were at 4.9, then I'm going to be going to Matt and saying we have to put budget tension in all the things that we do, not that it necessarily will change the outcome in each and every case, but that's something that's implied but not stated now in how we manage the district. I agree with what he said, we're going to need new revenue. Yes. But I would also like to know how we can commission this analysis that we haven't had since 2004, 2005, and just kind of general look at everything. I mean, how do we go about well, doing that? And I'll defer to Matt. Last time we did it in-house, it was uh, looking at uh, enrollment for the previous year for every single uh, course offering at the middle school and high school, uh, number of students and, and some history. Uh, so one option is to do it internally, another option is to hire someone as an assignment to do that statistical and analysis. I have to just tell you, this is my opinion, but hiring all these people, I mean what you said at one of the other meetings, you want to write your own curriculum so it is manner specific. Aren't the people here in Manor better equipped to know what is Manor specific? Yeah. yeah, so that would go in-house. 
that yeah, would that yeah, that would make more sense. And if that's what we did before, we have okay. on that. And we know based on the basic numbers that um, after salaries and benefits, special education costs are uh, a fantastic undertaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and one of the things you have a couple of items mentioned here to try to make sure that we're meeting student needs as precisely as possible. I have one question. So, where we have a student who's not educated within the district, how is that decision made? Can a, can a parent or guardian insist on a student being educated outside the district regardless of what data shows or history proves? I mean, it's, I mean the, the legal response to that would be it's up to the IEP team. Okay. But so, yeah, so I yeah, mean. Yeah, and I've had experience in that. Yeah. That's right. A parent cannot sign off on an IEP. It requires the district and the parent both to sign off. The, what we can introduce into the process is to build equivalent quality option within the district that we know is significantly cheaper and say that's our first preference. Not that we're just going to keep the student here and hope we can serve them, right. but build the internal program of equivalent or better quality and keep them here rather than many parents, uh, you know, they go through an IEP process, have already done their own homework, have come to some opinion about where's the best quality option and absent the data for us to say <coughs> here's data that matches or is even better quality right here at home, um, that's part, when I say budget tension, that's kind of what I'm saying is yeah. that the folks involved with the IEP process, the 504 process, are, are going to uh, be, uh, be expected to um, analyze, have Matt analyze the quality of our internal program offerings, if we need to increase the quality, do that, and then have that as the preferred option with parents subject to that process. At the end of the day, if a parent disagrees and we disagree and no one signs off, then it is lawyer against lawyer. Oh. And, and oh. sometimes, sometimes it's in the kid's best interest to go somewhere else because sure. of the programming or the kid's sure. specific needs or whatever. And, and to Dan's point too, if, you know, going down that route, it would be very hard for us to say to a student or a student's family that's been going out of district for five years, well now you're going to come back. Right. It's been done. I know, but it's... But, Dan, our salaries and benefits employee costs are 85% or 86%? Um, they're right now, we, it was around 86 before a crisis, we're down about 81% now. Okay. That's so it's in better. that traditional safety zone of 80 It's getting better. Yes. So you know, the other thing on the revenue side is I don't think we've come up with a definitive plan. We have the rice property or the building. Right. And then what are we going to do with that? Right. And right. that's something that we need to, you know, and that to some extent is an expense for us to right. absolutely maintain the building. Sure, I didn't know that. Just and so would a building, if we close another school, middle school or whatever, that's something right. to think about I, too. And that's another example, though, of budget tension. Assuming facilities are somewhat equal as far as the quality, the construction, the configuration, and you include budget tension and decision which one to close, closing, and I'll do ones we already did, closing a center street in a commercial area creates right. a better opportunity right. to sell the property at a reasonable price than closing a building that's not in a in commercial residential. area. You get a lot yeah. more pushback in the Correct. residential areas. Correct. And, and the zoning and all of those and things. So, right, line. right. Yeah. So if all other things are equal, and, and part of that is that uh, going into it, we have a strong belief that this will then be a facility not needed by the district, either because of some distance learning and the balanced learning model, or just the declining numbers. That's what I would call budget tension. At least talk about that in the decision making right. process. Whether that, how important it is at the end of the day, but just make sure that's included in the discussion. Mm -hmm. And this is all bearing some financial catastrophic hiccup. Yeah. Two years. Yeah, or the state yeah. changing their funding model. So <laughs> if. <laughs> Not to our advantage. So if we could just look at from the broad perspective of 
obviously we want to be cognizant of what the community's message has been. So we want to be as prudent as we possibly can, but we also recognize that we're here to educate the students of our community. So we want to make that our, you know, the sacred central portion of everything. So what would be, assuming that all those things could be taken into consideration and you have a, a good list here of some focal points that as management you could look at to try to enhance uh, cost savings in each of these five areas. Do you think it's possible to get through 2018-19 oh, yeah. at even money or a little bit in the black? Well, as you can see right now, um, we're predicting spending $8.7 million more than we take in for the 16-17 year. Even if we're able to reduce spending by 2%, um, yeah, that's $2.1 million. It's, it's not enough. But again, to multiply everything by five when we put sure. it in the five-year context, spending $10 million less is a lot better than spending $10 million right. uh, that we're currently spending. So uh, that's why we've drug our feet a little bit on 16-17. We don't want to lose some opportunities this new school year and budget year uh, if we're going to hit a target. And that, deliberately use the word target because again we can try as hard as we want we don't know if there's going to be another recession some economists are starting to say maybe the economic cycle is mature and we're, we're, we'll see another recession within five years we don't know uh, there's a new biennial budget next summer there'll be a new governor uh, sometime in that five-year time span and what implications that has uh, on there so what we want to do is if, we're, if we pick a future target, then incrementally in, in all the tactics we propose and any additional tactics we can identify, we can begin to work these numbers down. Uh, if you wanted to say absolutely eliminate them, we could do that, but that will invade significantly into the current quality of teaching and learning. Uh, sure. We can kind of pretty lean on the operational side. And anything that we do, any recommendation or guidance we do give you, it's not a stone tablet. Correct. No. I mean, we, we, we've got to have some flexibility in it to yeah. take on some of the variables yes. that you said that you know, we don't yeah. know what's going to happen. Just going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. We're so, just doing this now so you can do your five-year forecast, right? Well, it's and more than that. No, we haven't finalized the budget. Do I need to mm -hmm. change budget models? Do I have to build fiscal models to give student services to say this needs to be included when you're talking about options for a student with special needs. Do I need to build some fiscal impact statements for Matt on instructional, uh, the whole catalog of course offerings and the fiscal impact of the uh, voluntary offerings. So it, it's more than just the forecast, it's do I change the budget models that we're using from, and this gets back to discretionary building budgets, we've used a per pupil allocation, we've adjusted for less students, but we've added something for inflation to the per pupil amount. Do we go to some performance-based budgeting, some zero-based budget model? We've used zero-based budget model, but it's gotten a little fuzzy over the last three years for departmental budgets. Do we go to a performance-based budget? Do you have to prove success and how you said you were going to use the money to qualify for money next year. So it goes deeper than just what number in the forecast. It actually gets to that tactical level of how are we going to manage every dollar we spend and what type of fiscal impact data do I give Matt. And doesn't that go back to the business, the analysis that you just talked yes. about and that kind of stuff? But if you give us a target for how many years out you want this levy to last, that will help us backfill that. Yes. Is okay. three years realistic, Dan? Um, well, I tell you, in the state of Ohio, the average levy cycle is between three and four years. So I don't, given the history of the voting, given the very close margin and the remarkable success we had with the phenomenal story, we hadn't asked for 12 years. And, and 
we were very first and normally takes us two tries to pass new money so it's first try but only by a few hundred votes I do believe it's um, really um, uh, super positive to think if we let things go to normal three to four years three years based on current numbers um, that we're ready but that's exactly what you five were elected to do is represent the community and right. and have the pulse of the community to say um, how feasible is it to build our tactics of managing the community's finances uh, around where we think and again it's not written in stone but you have a better pulse of the community than than I would have or Matt would have. It would be easier if we said three years and then if the economy yeah. went better and we you know we made yeah. cuts and the analysis showed that we could cut this it would be easier to go from three to four than to say four and then need one in three yeah well because you're would in a hurry easier, up yeah. situation but, but again the burdens on yeah. us to explain why we couldn't go for it. that's a whole different discussion yeah. of There's that too you're, you're saying this is the target build fiscal tactics to get there uh, understanding that there, there is a blurry but distinct line of don't jeopardize quality of teaching and learning. So don't just gut the curriculum, don't just go to minimum staffing levels, but this is the target and then the burden shifts to us and to department heads and to principals to demonstrate what efforts we undertook and why that wasn't enough different than well let's give it the old college try and see what happens that in my experiences doesn't create that fiscal tension or budget tension to really affect we've got we we don't do business as usual as just defined by the typical school right. district we haven't since 2004 but based on our definition of business as usual which is very aggressive fiscal management to alter that, what we currently do, takes some something to happen. It just right. don't say try harder no. and but we'll see what happens. No, right. even right. in that analysis, it, it may come out that we're doing everything we can. Absolutely. And I'm just thinking that after 10 years, it should maybe be done yeah. again because it's just good business Absolutely. measure. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm kind of leaning towards um, a, a, a short term you know, three years, and then if things go better, good for us. Yep. Okay. It's not that um, Well, and I'm... I'm kind of conservative that way, I, you know. And yeah, I, I agree with agree you, but I'm also years. looking at these numbers. Even your conservative numbers look, are looking bad for 19, and you said yeah, something, yeah. Dan, about July of 2019 yeah. being a right. critical... We, we have to... Uh, we cannot adopt a budget with an $8 million deficit. So oh, counting this budget year, and we've already locked in staffing, again, that came in under target, but we have uh, three budget years to save $8 million beyond what we've already, all the things mm -hmm. we already do with staffing reductions based on student enrollment reductions. Or raise $8 million. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah. Well, so we, we've got to either <laughs> raise $8 million through <laughs> some of the things on that. Yeah. In the meeting summary, we did include some revenue possibilities um, that we could pursue. Uh, so or would your goal be the nine, nine, or we the could 19 begin man. immediately with selling rice, working on the rice property, couldn't we? I mean, that's a yes. message that you, taxpayers yeah. have asked. Mm -hmm. yes. What are you doing with that albacore? Right. I've had people ask me, "What are you doing with that property? Just closed. What do you need it for?" That's why yeah. they closed. Right. Yeah. yeah, and especially it's around closes it part time, right. but, but they know it costs money for it to sure. sit there. But especially around levy time, when we're asking for right. more money and we have an asset we're sitting on, I, that's a very reasonable question of, well. You know, why are you digging in my pocket? Why don't you sell that? You're not using it. I and some people that. even ask the question, well, we passed your levy, now you closed the school. Yeah. yeah. Yes, there's always. Hopefully it's not a. Well, it happens, but I think right. the message has to begin, and we've always moved the message forward, but you can't let up on the message that we're doing things fiscally responsible. And holding property is, you know, viewed by some people not fiscally responsible yeah, yeah. holding property that right. could be another resource. I and think we agree with that. Yeah. yeah. 
So, Dan, you gave us these two sheets, one with a $19 million deficit and one with $8 mm -hmm. million. Which one would be your target that you'd be working on? Well, given if I were sitting in my seat, I would say $19 million. If I were sitting in your seat, I'd say you've been consistently conservative, so use the $8 million. If I were a board member looking at this, I'd say as much as I'm working to refine and, and we're changing again this year some of our formulas, but I would look at that $8.2 million. And, and again, if we say do your best uh, to get get that balance, then that would say in 2020 in the spring we'll need a levy. And again, it's a, the amount of the millage is somewhat a function of time also. The longer you wait, if you look in that last year, it's predicted we take in 86 million, we spend 120 million. Well, you add um, the new tax levy produces 8 million, so that's 94 million. Even if we reduce spending to 117, there's still a huge gap there. So we're yeah. headed to a big cliff. Even if we get to zero that next year, we're going to have a $15 million deficit. Uh, we raise about 1.8 million for every one mil taxation. So to raise that amount of money in one year, it's going to take us above five mils. We don't want to be there. So uh, that's why if, if um, the, the target year is half the equation, the, the unspoken assumption Matt and I have made is we've got to keep the next levy request under five mils based on our research mm -hmm. and, and our history and, and, and as far out the as last we can. time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, it, the more guidance you give us, I guess the more weight I have to put fiscal tension and budget tension into Matt's world. Not, not that he won't, he's not receptive to it anyhow, but again, we're talking about individual department heads, we're talking about principals, we're talking about 600 faculty, we're talking about 380 support staff. They're going to say, man, we've already done a great job, we're working really hard, uh, there is no more we can do. So absent saying, we recognize how hard everybody's worked to get us where we are, but we have to do more. If we just say, let's hope we do more, that's a different mm -hmm. budget tension than yeah. we say, mm -hmm. we have this yeah. target, we have to figure out a way to do it. Now, Dan, three mills, 4.9 was 8.2 million. Yeah. Three mills is how much? What was that? Five? Yeah. Roughly. So is it is a good idea to, or a, a, I would suggest we say, a three mil levy, target our expense control reduction, and do whatever we have to do some to, to plan a three mil levy. Should something not happen, should the worst happen, then we would choose to do 4.5 or 4.9 because we fall short of trimming it to a well, three. I a mean, three mil levy gets us five million oh twenty nine. So, so I, I'm just suggesting is that as a thought of set that as what we agree, yeah. or at least which if you just take this work our expenses up, to that we got to cover an eight point two million dollar deficit. Uh, we'd have to raise five million uh, in 2018, yeah, because you collect a year and a half at a okay. time uh, for there, and that would be uh, about seven and a half million. So it gets you close to that. That's saying we're going to have a levy in 18. If you say three mills continue the fiscal uh, uh, tactics that we currently have in place. So, okay, so maybe a 3.5 mil, some other number. I yeah. just chose three as a. Yeah, but then I'm moving it forward a whole year to 18, not 19. Okay. Yeah. I just, I think the community, the, the, the amount of time, energy, and cost mm -hmm. involved in launching and maintaining that levy campaign is so daunting yes. and the way the community's perception I mean I, I might be mistaken like when we had the discussion between a renewable levy versus a continuing levy I don't know that the average voter necessarily 
makes a decision based on that word. Right. I mean, for yeah. some people, that's they, consideration. Yeah, but like didn't you just vote for a levy? Is yes. going to be the what I think a typical voter yeah. wants to know. So. And and then you go back to your point, the levy history going back to 1980, when levies were occurring every three or four years, the first one failed, the second one passed, or the third time passed. So. That's kind of the community's norm. I want to. Re I know we've got to get over to greet there. I, we can either come back after the meeting, or we can schedule another one. Or if you want to just give us the guidance um, to uh, do more than we're doing now, to um, get 1920 balanced, um, knowing that that means we're going to begin to explore these tactics. First up is an analysis of all the optional course offerings uh, based on student enrollment, uh, I selling was, rice. I was going to go back to that analysis. When you first presented that, and I don't want this to go on any longer either, I guess I can talk to you later, but I thought it was an analysis of everything the school system did, including the student teacher proportion. Yes. yes, that is true. Okay, because you keep going back to well, that, so, but it yeah, should be example. everything. Yeah, sure. and, and, and what, yes. And then my question is, we're, part of that analysis would be looking at these ways to get revenue that are mm -hmm. on the sheet mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. well, it's kind of like an over business plan of the whole. Oh, and then, no, then I, I was saying something different that okay. when we were in crisis, we looked at uh, how to resolve the crisis and then that, and how to never get back there again. One of the things we studied, and if you remember, we declined enrollment from almost 12,000 to about 8,000 and our staff actually grew by 100 people. Mm -hmm. So we had the lines going in opposite directions. We had less students, more staff, and we said we had to, uh, it's not the correct term to use, but right size. So part of that analysis at that time is how can we keep be adding people when we have 2,000 less students? What we did then as a, a, a part of that was if we're offering a, if we have a teacher offering a course that has three students in it every period for five periods, is that an opportunity to find a different way to serve the students and reduce staffing? But you it did sure more than like, that, right? Absolutely. I mean, you did like oh, a yeah. whole, that's what I was asking. Yeah. You did more than but, that. But that's, and that okay. gets back to the, in the meeting notes, all these so different tactics touch on all those things. All those different ideas. Yeah, if you remember, okay. we negotiated pay uh, freezes, uh, some I won't tell you what I remember. Okay. <laughs> but yes, we did absolutely everything. But you looked at everything. Emerged from crisis. Okay. And that's what we tried to do was be, we're not in crisis now, we're in a good place now, and, and this list, the meeting summary minutes, listed the various tactics we believe are the most viable given yes. our fiscal beliefs of managing the largest expenses. So absolutely all those things will be explored, but again, we, at that time, we were just uh, not uh, thoughtful in some of the key financial indicators on how we got there in 2004, we, we reset everything, we, and that reset's still largely in place, so we don't need quite to start over again where we came totally disconnected, and the opportunities, again, are in the big spend areas. It's not in photocopiers, and we just put in a no film system, it's gonna Payroll reduce phone costs, but that's not enough to say we can buy right, it good here. Enough. It makes sense that if our goal at this point would be to be balanced through 2020, the end of that 1920 school year. And the benefit of doing that is that there's a little wiggle room. If there is an unexpected shift in something that has a significant impact on us and we have greater expenses and lower revenues and all that other mm -hmm. stuff, that we're better prepared to respond to that than if we kind of hedge our bets and like no. Yes. So I hear I hear you saying get it through 2020. That's what I I'm thinking. That's what I 1920. Heard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, right that now we the, would be you're asking even three years. us to do our best to balance 1920. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. because I mean look at four I, years I, you know, like we, we had I don't know 
many more students when we had a three-tiered transportation right model. and that's still one of the can we go to a two-tier because we have not quite half as yeah. about 60 percent of the students i think is what we were had mm -hmm. when we had the and and just three not to prolong this a lot and that balance between matt's world and my world if you ask me on facilities was the optimum thing. I'd say, look what we did. I, we built one large high school. I'd yeah. say we built one large middle school on the campus, transportation simpler, maximum efficiency. We're done, whether or not that's feasible or not. But some of these things, I can be, uh, you know, insert the absolute best using only a filter of fiscal impact mm -hmm. and nothing else, not the community impact, not the instructional impact. So trying to find that balance, it's not the craziest thing. No, those so, are the ideas that we usually do well with. Yeah, <laughs> actually, honestly. I, I kind of like the possibilities there because a newer building built with flexible spaces yeah. to meet changing needs. Be more in the energy as well. efficient. It would, uh, you uh, know, you know, incorporating, obviously, the technology. Right. But, um, so those are type of discussions that whether or not they're a tactic that balances 1920 can become part of that discussion of that we want to permanently step back from the district's historic norm and the state of Ohio's historic norm of four-year levy cycles. Let's look at, you know, to Sally's point, everything. And again, I could build the most fiscally efficient system there is. I don't know if the community would accept it. I don't know if instructionally it would, would be sacrifice too yeah. much yeah. If, so, if it was right. solely driven on dollars. So yes. something not to walk out of here with is that we're going to build a new middle school on this campus. That's just an idea you just floated out. I'm just saying. <laughs> it needs to be explored. It needs to be explored. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want Did you get this. what you needed for this meeting? Yeah. Is that what you needed? This was a work session. I right hear in 1920. 1920, yeah. is that what you need? And maybe involving our community and, and advisory. And, and doing the analysis. Yeah, sure. okay. Okay. Can I adjourn? Whatever. Yeah. A motion and second, please. Second. I'll motion then. Bill Shaw. Bill Shaw. Mr. Shaw. Hey, Those sorry. <laughs> yeah. We're voting. Yes. Mr. Shaw, yes. Mr. Tuttle. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Mrs. Reiner. Yes. Ms. Gisling. Yes. Ms. Miller. Yes. No All right, this is